We are now up to verse uh, 14 of John, uh, John, Matthew 17. Um, we've had the transfiguration the last couple of weeks. Last week, they came down the mountain and there was the uh, issue of Elijah, which we dealt with. There are several things contextually that are important. As we come to verse 14, um, I just want you to note the language as we begin today. And when they came to the crowd. So who comes to the crowd? That's them. Who's the them? Previous verse, the disciples who understood he'd spoken about John the Baptist. So Matthew is presenting this not as a period of time has passed. Matthew is saying they went up the mountain. There is this that happens on the mountain. They come down from the mountain. There is this conversation. And now they're with the crowd. And so there, there is in Matthew's storytelling the way he's presenting it. And remember, and and, and let me just say, as we as we kick in, actually, this is one of those stories where there's lots of variation between the different Gospels that share it. So what we call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all have this story and all give different details. And when we have that, I think we need to be particularly aware that Matthew is telling the story that he is telling. I, as I prepare, need to be aware of what Mark and Luke say so that I don't misrepresent the occasion, but we really don't want to be distracted by them because we want Matthew to tell us his story. And in Matthew's story, we've gone from the three on the mountain with Jesus to the twelve and now to the crowd. And that's deliberate. There's this progression. And that's going to be important today. I think the other thing is that um, when we are looking at the broader context... Really, from chapter 16, we've been dealing quite heavily. Going back to 13, we're dealing with Jesus now training the disciples for this new kingdom that is not what they expect. And really, from chapter 16, the issue has been the next phase of that training. They now know, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The disciples, apart from Judas, are saved. They know that Jesus is the Messiah. And they trust him. But their problem is they misunderstand the doctrine of the Messiah. And I think all of us can relate to that, can't we, to some degree? Like the time that we were saved and we first trusted in Jesus, did we know Jesus as well as we know him now? Did we understand the character of God in the way that we understand it now? And do we understand God now in the way that we're going to understand him in the years to come? And I think that we need to see that faith in Jesus doesn't mean knowing everything about Jesus. And they have exercised faith. They believe he's the Messiah. And yet the transfiguration, as I repeatedly said the last two weeks, was showing that Peter's understanding of Jesus was at the same time not high enough nor low enough. In other words, Peter had this middle ground where he thought Jesus is the Messiah. Here he is. He's this guy who's with us. He's going to come in and he is going to um, he is going to set up his kingdom on earth as he is. And it's like, Peter, you don't you don't get Jesus. You don't get what this Messiah is from Scripture. You're not going low enough. He has to suffer and die. You're thinking of him just as this glorious figure. But equally, you're not going high enough. Because you think his glory is just, he's going to be this warrior king who's going to establish a kingdom. So the transfiguration is showing how high Jesus is. That he is God incarnate and his glory is being veiled by his human flesh. And that when he comes, he will come in glory. Not as you see him now. Not as you see him day to day, but he's going to come in glory. And that's how he's going to establish his kingdom. It's going to be far greater than you could possibly imagine. And yet at the same time, he is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer at the hands of the leaders. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. and He's going to rise again on the third day. He is going to be humiliated and suffer. And he is going to go so much lower than you can understand a Messiah having to go. So they believe in the right person, but they don't know the person that they believe in. And that's what the training is about in this context. And I think the only other thing I really want to say contextually as we go into this section is that 
this has all happened in one flow at Caesarea Philippi, and they are there right at the, the cliff face, hence the whole, upon this rock I will build my church, as we talked about. And in those mountains, the highest peak in the mountains where they are at the, you know, at the foot of, um, just like Burbank is at the bottom of the Verdugos, they're at the bottom of these mountains, and the highest of the mountains there is Mount Hermon, which is the place that traditionally it was uh, associated with the coming of the uh, sons of God to take the daughters of men in Genesis 6, and the Nephilim and all of that. So Mount Hermon, in the same way that Mount Sinai, where Moses was given the law, has become associated as a place of God, so Mount Hermon has become associated as a place for darkness. And, and wickedness. And we've dealt with that the last few weeks. I'm not going to re- go over that again. But we just need to know that contextually as we come to this section. Okay? Because, because Matthew is taking us through this in one failed swoop. And really, I think next week when we come to verse 24, when they came to Capernaum, you, you get a distinctive break there, don't you? They've now left that place. They've gone to another place. But here we're kind of following that same thread. And um, we'll, we'll see that at the end where he reiterates 22 and 23, the need for Jesus to go and to suffer and to die. It kind of wraps up this whole section of the low and the high and the training of the disciples. So with all that in mind for big picture stuff, look at verse 14. They came to the crowd. Crowd is a crucial word throughout Matthew's gospel. The crowd as a collective singular, is a character in Matthew's Gospel. We've mentioned this several times. And they, they play a specific role in his storytelling. Now, we know at this point the crowd is representing this wicked generation of Israel who have rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. They are not going to be given another sign except for one. What's that? The sign of Jonah, the sign of the resurrection. Is that a good thing? No, that's not a good thing. Because the sign of the resurrection is not an opportunity for them to repent as a nation, as a generation. Rather, it is a judgment against them. You were wrong. And so, there is much animosity, but yet the crowd is still fascinated with Jesus who does these miracles. But he's not doing miracles, broadly speaking, to the public. But we're going to see an exception here, and we'll see why in a moment. And what happens is a man, a particular man, comes to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. Let's hold it there. Okay? Jesus is not just going into the synagogues, into the cities, and healing all the sick. We saw that in the early chapters. We're not going to see it anymore. He doesn't do that. He doesn't just walk into a place and heal a bunch of people. He did that before because what he was doing is he had a message. And the message was, hey Israel, you have to repent because the kingdom is at hand. I am your king, here is your kingdom, this is your opportunity, but you have to turn. You have to repent. You have to turn from your ways, no matter how religious they may be, and you have to turn to me, and Israel wouldn't do that. But as he was preaching that message, he was authenticating that message by showing that he had the authority. By proving through his miracles that he was the king and backing up his words with his actions, so to speak. Now that they've rejected that offer, that's not happening anymore. So why does he do a miracle here? Well, he does a miracle here because this man comes and falls on his knees and begs for mercy. This is an example of someone of faith who comes to Jesus. And Jesus is still, he's training his disciples, and one of the things he's training them is to trust him. And this man is coming to Jesus in faith. And it's going to be more significant than merely that, as we'll see in a moment. But that's why he heals him. It's not for the crowds, it's for this man. And there's going to be much illustration in this passage about the need for us as individuals to come to Jesus at our time of need and to fall on our knees. So the reason he wants mercy, Lord have mercy on my son for he has seizures and suffers terribly for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Now, 
what is going to become clear as we go further is that this boy is demon demonized, demon possessed. Um, we talked a little bit about that, but I think this is significant because of where it falls. Um, whenever we come to these passages, I want to be careful. I don't want to get into a whole theology of de- demonology and, and what have you. And I mentioned briefly last time about how in the intertestamental period, the belief was that evil spirits weren't demons per se, but they were the souls of the Nephilim and what have you. And, you know, we could get on to all of that. I think the point here is where this falls contextually. We're in a section that is happening in the shadow of Mount Hermon. And I think it's no accident that in the place where demons dwell, in their mindset, in their thinking, we have a miracle that is specifically a demon-related miracle. The casting out of an evil spirit of a demon and what have you. Now, some versions use here the word epileptic with regards to the seizures. And for many, many years, there's been confusions over, uh, you know, did they think in those days that everything was to do with demons when it was just illnesses? Did they uh, did they take things that we now in our superior ways know to be mental illnesses or physical illnesses and attribute those things to demons? And I don't think that was the case at all. Do you want to know, was this epilepsy or was this a demon? And the answer is yes. We've already seen demons that cause people to be mute. Was the person mute? Yes, they were mute. Were they demon-possessed? Yes, they were demon-possessed. So sometimes these possessions would lead to physical manifestations in various ways. And whether you want to diagnose this as epilepsy or not, it's clear that it was caused by this spirit because Jesus cast it out and he's then healed. So we are certain to make that connection. No, I don't think that every time you have someone who has epilepsy that you need to be praying for demons to be cast out. I don't think that's what this is teaching us here. Um, I think what is clear is, you know, I've had friends in the past with epilepsy and it's not quite the same as this. This seems to be a very extreme case where this, this child is just throwing himself into the fire, throwing himself into the water. And it seems as if the, the spirit within him is trying to kill him. Now, as I said, I don't want to get into a big demonology, but I will say this in passing as I have before, because I think there are some churches today that hyper-focus on these things, and sometimes to ridiculous extremes. There are churches with a completely straight face, who if you say to them that you're struggling to give up alcohol, cigarettes, or perhaps even chocolate, that you need to have the demon cast out of you that you can be free. And there is a such a colossal failure to understand the Christian life in general, let alone anything to do with demons, that those things should be ridiculous to our mindset. But... The question that people in our circles will still have is to what degree can people still be demonized? And I just want to very briefly say this. We in the Gospels see a lot of people who are possessed by evil spirits that are cast out by Jesus and the disciples. We come to the book of Acts and we see it, but it begins to decrease. In the New Testament letters to the churches, which are coming just a few decades later, We have instructions for so many things, it's ridiculous. I mean, everything from lawsuits to marriages to divorces to, uh, you know, how you treat your neighbor to, you know, passages that we don't fully understand. I mean, you know, head coverings for women and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's lots of details about lots of specifics of life in all the various multitude of letters written to many different New Testament churches. Do you know how many times they talk about casting demons out of people? Big fat zero. And I think that we have to be instructed by that. If, if a church is constantly looking for demons and casting them out willy-nilly and trying to do all of this, I, I think that we're just, it's just not what we're taught in how churches should be functioning. And I think the ultimate reason for that is because the New Testament places such an emphasis upon, and this isn't true in the Gospels, and it isn't true throughout the book of Acts, it kind of phases in, but the church 
begins in Acts 2, and the church is delineated by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit to all. And that didn't happen immediately. It was only Jews who had the indwelling spirit in Acts chapter 2. Then several years later, it was Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And then it only became Gentiles almost a decade later in Acts chapter 10. And I think when we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, then we can't have evil spirits indwelling us. So what is a solution if someone has does have an evil spirit indwelling them? The solution is to preach the gospel. Because when they're saved, they'll have the Holy Spirit. And so the emphasis in the church is to preach the gospel. And I think that that's something that, you know, I just it's nice to remind you of these things occasionally. Because I know there's lots of misunderstanding out there in, in the church uh, circles. Um, I also think there was definitively a special effort at this time because of the coming of Christ and because of the apostolic age. So, anyhow, all of that said, we have a young boy, a son of this man, or he may be older, we don't give, we're not given the details, but he is throwing himself into the fire and into water to basically kill him. And then verse 16 is the crucial thing for this passage. I brought him to your disciples... And they could not cure him. This is crucial. This is absolutely crucial because the whole story revolves around this. The disciples weren't able to help him. I want you to keep your place there in Matthew 17, but turn back with me to Matthew 10. In Matthew chapter 10, um, Jesus appoints the twelve and he sends the disciples out. He, at that stage, this is obviously pre the, um, the rejection of Christ by the nation, but they were given authority to cast out demons. And uh, they were given authority to do miracles and they come back and they're astounded that these things are happening. Wow, this is happening, you know, we, we, we were amazed at this. And so Jesus has given them authority to do these things. Now, there's a little question here. When Jesus sends them out, he sends them out because the message has to go to the nation of Israel. Verse 8 of chapter 10, or let's go from verse 7. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So very clearly and very specifically, he is giving them a um, commission. And remember, I mentioned this in chapter 10. That was quite a time ago now, so it's not unhelpful to have a reminder. In Matthew's gospel, there are two commissions. We focus on the second one, the Great Commission, with good reason. But there is this first commission in Matthew 10... And it was very specifically for that period because he's saying to them, you need to go and preach. And he says in verse 6, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, go to Israel and preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is the kingdom of heaven at hand within reach for Israel now? No, it isn't. It hasn't been since the end of chapter 12. The kingdom offer is gone. Now they're going to have the spiritual kingdom, which wasn't revealed. The mystery kingdom, if you like. And, and so everything's changed. So this commission, in a sense, is not in place. So when we come to verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Do those things still apply? And you can't just say yes willy-nilly. Exegetically, in the sense of trying to ascertain what the scriptures are teaching, that was part of a commission that clearly is no longer in effect. So I think, I think this idea that the disciples can just go and cast out a demon, because, because the disciples were amazed that the demons obeyed them, weren't they? Right? Does that imply huge amounts of faith? It doesn't, does it? It's like, okay, uh, demon, get out. Oh, he's gone. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. That doesn't imply that these are hugely faithful people. The reason he came out was because Jesus says, you've got authority. Just go do this. You're going to heal, do this and this. Why? Because in the same way that my message is authenticated by my actions, you who have my authority are preaching my message and we're going to back that up with my actions through you. That's what's going on in chapter 10. That's just a revision for those of you who are here, right? 
So now when we come to chapter 17, I don't think we should presume that they automatically have authority just to cast out demons willy-nilly. And so what we have here is a course correction where Matthew is showing us how things are going to be post-rejection in this realm. In the same way that we were told, okay, pre-rejection, this is what you disciples, this is what you get to do, this is how you do it. Now we're seeing something different. And so I don't think we should be amazed at this difference because everything else from that context has changed as well. Okay, so bear that in mind. So Jesus answered and said, this is Jesus' response to the situation, here's his son, have mercy on him, seizures, suffers, fire, water, all of that, and the disciples couldn't help. Jesus answers, oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Now, many commentaries at this point seem to think that Jesus is referring to the disciples. And I guess at first glance you can understand that, but that isn't what's happening here. And, you, and there's multiple clues, you know, evidence to tell us why he's not. I think firstly, look at the uh, two things he uses to describe them. Unbelieving and perverse. Well, the one thing that is going through these two chapters, this big theme that we're learning, is that the disciples did have faith. That's the whole point. Peter exercises faith and Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. Right? So they do have faith. So unbelieving does not apply to them. In a few verses time, we're going to see that their problem was little faith. Unbelieving is no faith. They have little faith. Not the same situation. And I don't think that perverse is something that he's using to describe his disciples at this point. The other key clue is who is he referring to? Unbelieving and perverse generation. We've seen throughout Matthew that the use of the word generation in this context is very specific and definitive in what it refers to. Generation is referring to that generation of Israel for whom, remember, it will be worse on the day of judgment than Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah because they were the generation to whom the long-promised Messiah came and they rejected that Messiah on the grounds that he himself was demon-possessed. So yeah, that generation was a problem. And that's why I made it point to... To tell you at the beginning, look at who he's come to now. He's come to the crowd. The crowd is a particular character in Matthew's story. And this crowd is a crowd of people who predominantly are Jews and who have predominantly rejected him and to whom there is no longer an offer of a kingdom because they have rejected him and his kingship. And so he says to the crowd... You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? He's rebuking the crowd. And I think this is significant because he's not rebuking this man. I don't think here he's rebuking the disciples who weren't able to help. What he's doing is he's rebuking the crowd. Contextually, why would he be rebuking the crowd? I mean, think about this situation. The disciples have come down from the mountain. They've just come back to the masses. Here in the masses, this guy comes and falls on his knees, right? And what has the man done? He clearly is exercising faith, because that's why Jesus is going to heal his son. There's no criticism of this man. There's no failure of this man. What's he done? Well, first of all, he's gone to the disciples, right? Why did he go to the disciples? Because he's going to Jesus, and Jesus isn't available. Why is Jesus not available? He's up a mountain with Peter, James, and John. So there's the only the other disciples who are there. So he's going to Jesus, but he's going to Jesus through those disciples. Those disciples, and we'll deal with that in a moment, aren't able to help. So why is the crowd being rebuked here? I think the answer, I mean, it's not obvious, it doesn't shout out, so I think we have to kind of dig a bit, but I, th I do think clearly that it's the crowd that's being rebuked. And I think the answer is, here in this situation, what has this man done? He's gone to the disciples of Jesus, and now he's going to Jesus, because they couldn't help him in Jesus' absence. But what has the crowd done in all of this? The crowd are the ones who represent the rejecting of Jesus. 
In other words, look, here's the deal. You had to turn and trust. You have to not go your way, not go the Pharisees' way, not go the, the way of your heart. You have to turn to Jesus, go his way and trust in him. And here is this man in this moment of crisis and he's going to Jesus, initially through the disciples and then to Jesus, and he's going in the midst of all this sea of unbelief. Why is Jesus angry with them? Because the job of Israel was to recognize and point to the Messiah and they've rejected him. So every time there is a a morsel of faith that finds itself in the midst of this blindness, in the midst of this perverse and wicked and unbelieving generation. It is not only a light in darkness, it's a rebuke to the unbelievers who should have known better. And I think that we we need to see and to recognize that. Guys, you are going to find this more and more as time goes by. I've said it countless times and I'll say it countless times more. But when I was a young man, you could write, I could write on my resume, I could, you know, looking for a job as a young guy, I could write, I go to church, I'm in a youth group, I, you know, I'm involved in the Christian group at school or college or whatever else. And that was a, you know, check, 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 brilliant. This is a nice, trustworthy guy. Now you put that stuff on your resume and you might as well just give up on the job. Right? Because, because we've gone from the Christians being the, the upstanding members of society to Christians being the, the nasty, hateful bigots. We haven't moved. Society has. Right? So, so we're now in this situation where we have to recognize that every time that we express trust in Christ, that we express faith in Christ, that we stand for Christ, that we turn to Christ, that we believe the things that Christ teaches, that we are going to be a statement to an unbelieving and perverse generation around us. Be ready for it. And Jesus is, I think... Making this point additionally to make clear this ain't for you guys. I'm about to do what I have been doing in the past. I'm about to heal someone, do a miracle, and you guys are here, so you're going to kind of see it. But this ain't for you. You're perverse. You're unbelieving. I'm sick of you. You know? And again, these are the kind of passages and the kind of verses that takes the world's false understanding of Jesus you know, you'll get people who maybe are nominally associated with Christianity. You know, maybe they're raised as a Catholic. Maybe they still go to Mass. Maybe they got, got taught it and they kind of think in the back of their mind they're kind of a Christian. And their idea of Jesus is he's just this, he's this just kind of woke socialist who loves everybody and, you know, rah, rah, rah and all of this kind of stuff. And these kind of verses are this solemn reminder, you know. How long shall I put up with you? Perverse, unbelieving people. He's making it clear. This ain't for you guys. You guys, this is not a sign for you. This is not anything for you. And more so, this man's faith is evidence against you. And so that's what's going on, I think, here in this section. This is how Matthew, uniquely leaving out many of the details from Mark and Luke, is presenting this. And so he asked the son to be brought to him and Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him. The first of those hymns is not the boy. The boy is not to blame for his epilepsy. The boy is not to blame for being demon possessed. Maybe he did something wrong to allow that to happen. I don't know. Maybe he led a sinful life that enabled that to become a reality. I don't know. But I think the context here suggests that Jesus is rebuking the demon who then comes out of him. And the boy was cured at once. And so with verse 18... Jesus does what we're used to Jesus doing. I've taken great pains to explain to you the uniqueness and the differences here compared to previous ones. And hopefully you've all got that. But essentially verse 18 ends the miracle itself. But Matthew isn't really interested in the details of the miracle. Matthew is interested in the training of the disciples. And that's really what this passage is about. So that leads us to verse 19. The disciples came to Jesus privately. 
Notice that word privately. We've been seeing it a little bit because what's happening, of course, is, you know, we had the, here's the parables and now they're explained privately. Here's this happening and now this is what's going on privately. And so we have this situation where we've gone from three on the mountain, the disciples getting together as they come down, talking about Elijah, and now they're back with the crowd. So the explanation of the training now has to be privately. And they have said, why could we not cast it out? So, and again, you've got Matthew. Matthew is a masterful storyteller, right? And you can follow these threads through Matthew. Let's, let's follow the story of the crowd from the baptize, John the Baptist baptizing and on. Let's follow the story of the disciples. And really here the focus is the story of the disciples. So in chapter 10, they cast out demons and they're like, oh wow, that worked, I'm surprised. And so they went to somebody else and they cast another demon out. Oh wow, I'm casting out demons. Here's a person who's sick, let's heal them. Wow, they're healed. This is amazing. You know, because Jesus has just said, I give you my authority, you can do it. We've got a mission here. The mission is we've got to go and show Israel that I'm the king. And so they turn and repent and we establish the kingdom. Off you go. And now that they're used to that, they're surprised that they can't cast him out. Can you see how Matthew's done that? Here they are his disciples, they've never cast a demon out before. Jesus says, I'll give you authority to do that. They now cast out demons and they're like, wow, that works. And now Israel's rejected and they can't cast demons out and they go, oh, that doesn't work anymore. That's what's going on here. That's the story Matthew's telling. So why could we not cast it out? And so this really then becomes more of an explanation of how things are in this post-rejection phase. <coughs> And so he says to them, verse 20, because of your little faith. Okay, so the reason clearly stated is that they do have faith. That's not the issue here. They're believers. They have faith. They trust in Jesus, but their faith needs to grow. And we've just been learning this. This is what we've been dealing with for a few chapters now. Do you remember Peter walking on the water? He gets out and he walks on water. Wow, that's incredible faith. And then he looks at the wind and the waves and he gets wet. He starts to sink. His faith is not complete. Peter believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow, that takes faith, right? Has he earned that? Has he figured that out because he's super clever? No, my Father in heaven revealed this to you, Peter. So Peter has been given faith. He has faith. But does Peter know how high Jesus is and how glorious he is? No. Does Peter understand how low Jesus has to go to the cross? No, he rebuked Jesus when Jesus told him that. So they've got to learn and they've got to grow in their faith and they've got to grow and learn to trust him. And trials like epileptic sons who throw themselves into fire and water are opportunities for growth. We still need to learn to be more Christian and less American. We want the American dream. We want to be comfortable and cozy. Feet up in the big boy and put that remote control in our hand and have our bills paid and be comfortable. Guys, the economics in the coming generations is going to make that American dream just more and more of a distant thing for so many people. And we're going to be forced to to really consider what our faith is. Because we still, I think, as Christians in this country, we want to be comfortable more than we want to be mature. We want to be comfortable more than we want to be mature. Trials are things to us that are all bad. This last week has been an important week for this church. This last week we had um, Pam's husband Brian pass from cancer after much time and much suffering. And Pam testifies that it was only after he was diagnosed with cancer and she was walking through that horrific trial that God used that trial to bring her to faith. And so she, after 30 years in a cult, came to this church as a new believer, and grew rapidly in faith because of the ongoing trial. 
And we, united with her in faith, prayed for the salvation of her husband. And he, literally weeks before God took him, he came to faith. And God granted him, even when he was ready to go, enough time afterwards so that the family could be assured through this transformation of his heart that even after his voice box was gone and he couldn't speak, that he could still show the transformation in his heart by the Holy Spirit who now indwelt him. And salvation came at such a late hour. And how, how do you look at a situation like that and say, Cancer's just this terribly bad thing in, in every way. Without that cancer, Pam would still be in a cult and her husband would be under eternal judgment. But God in his mercy brought cancer to that family. And now we pray for their children that as God seems to have softened their hearts, that he might open their eyes as well and that they might be saved. And then that cancer would have four people led to the Lord. And there may be more from them. You see, we're so obsessed with our comfort and well-being that we don't recognize that God is in the business of using trials to shake us and rattle us and to, and to make us trust in Him. And this man had come on his knees before Jesus for his son because what else do you do when you recognize who Jesus is? You just have to turn and you have to say, here I am in front of the unbelieving crowd. Here I am in the view of the Pharisees and Sadducees who will cast me out of the synagogue. And I'm going to go on my knees before Jesus because he is all I have. And the disciples have got to learn that their faith has got to grow. They've got to know who he is more. They've got to trust him more. They've got to come to the point where he's all they have and they rely completely upon him. I don't think this passage is for us to particularly work out what area of their faith is lacking and how their faith might grow and what have you. Scripture, broadly speaking, talks about maturity in trials and what have you. We, this is not something that is sort of, uh, you know, trying to be very specific about what aspect of their faith was missing. It, it, you'll notice in verse 21, there is a verse in parentheses, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. The reason it's in those square brackets is because it wasn't originally written by Matthew. There are later manuscripts where additions in the margin got moved into the main text and got copied and it ended up in the King James Version. But the oldest and most reliable manuscripts don't have this verse. But what it illustrates, as far as I'm concerned, that, that in brackets isn't scripture. Matthew didn't write that. But what it illustrates is that very early on in the church, they were like, well, what's lacking? How do we explain this? And that's not the question that's going on here. The question going on is, are you prepared to trust in Christ fully? Peter had enough faith to step on the water, but he didn't have so much faith that when the winds and waves were getting were there around him, that he could keep his eyes on Jesus. That's the problem being illustrated here. He's got to grow in faith. They've got to grow in faith. And friends, we've got to grow in faith. And if you pursue comfort, you will never grow in faith. If the American dream is more important to you than holiness, you may gain the world, but you'll lose your soul. You see, how could I rest, use injury as an excuse to rest when I got... Passages like this to teach. It would be self-condemnation on a ridiculous scale, wouldn't it? And so, the little faith is the problem. Don't overanalyze that. they just got to grow in faith. Because in the past, they were able just to, regardless of their faith, cast out a demon. And it was as if Jesus had said it because they were given the authority to do it. But now, post-rejection... There's the issue of how much do you trust? What's your faith like? And then Jesus is going to say something that I think we understand as being discouraging initially, but actually I think it's the opposite. It's really encouraging. For truly, I say to you, Matthew uses this phrase about 30 times. It's, 
it's your kind of pay attention, listen, this is important. What I'm about to say is really important. Now that's, that's significant. He doesn't say, for truly I say to you, it's because of your little faith. He says, because of your little faith, now pay attention. In other words, this is more important than the littleness of their faith. That's encouraging. Number one. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, we've had this already with the parables, but the idea of the mustard seed is it was in their common usage, the smallest of seeds, and therefore it becomes idiomatic of something astonishingly small. He's already mentioned the mustard seed in the context of they, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It starts very small and it's going to get very, very big. Right? Now, this isn't, a, this isn't to be talking about the kingdom per se, but what he's saying is it's the same thing. If you've got this tiny faith, we can do great big things with it. Right? When, when Brian got saved... Right at the end of his life, no training, no going to Bible conferences, reading his Bible plan every day for years, none of that. And yet that little faith could be used to witness to his family. Peter, as we know, was a bit of a pighead, a bit stubborn. He wasn't rocky. He was Petros, which is pebble. He was a little one, and he was constantly problematic. Jesus told him about that he had to fulfill the Isianic servant song passages, and Peter rebukes him and tells him off. Peter is going to deny him three times when, when Jesus does go to the cross. Peter's all sorts of problems. And yet, Peter's little faith was used to bring into the kingdom the Samaritans and the Gentiles. Every one of us here who is not Jewish has a place in the church because God used the faith of Peter to bring us into the church. He had the keys to the kingdom. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young in the faith you are. I don't care what sins you struggle with. I don't care what sins you continue to struggle with. If somebody at the last weeks of their life who is not even able to speak can give testimony to his trust in Christ and his assurance of salvation and his desire to be with Jesus and speak of the transformative and illustrate the transformative nature of Jesus in his life, what excuses do any other one of us have? None. Zero. Zippo. Our faith can be used to do astonishing things because, not because we are great, but because our Savior is great. And I think that when we recognize that, then we will do great things. And that is the point. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible for you. There's several things going on here. Of course, this is one of those verses misused by the name it and claim it gang, those heretics in the church who touch the screen and you'll be healed. Oh, if you're not healed, well, your check obviously wasn't big enough. Give me a bigger check and touch the screen and you'll be healed. Show your faith and all that kind of nonsense. And they love this. But despite the fact that they turn to those verses, none of them have moved any mountains, have they? So clearly that's not what the passage is saying. Now, the idea of moving mountains was something that was idiomatic and it was used by the rabbis. I've read some rabbinical stuff again this week, which is where the rabbis will talk about these things. They talk about moving trees and moving mountains. And it's convenient for us because this has now become idiomatic to us in English because of the Bible. You get people who aren't Christians who will say... You know, I think, I think if, we really, if we really brainstorm this in our office, we can make this happen. We can move mountains. And even though they're not Christians and they're talking about their own efforts, they're using the same idiom. So it's idiomatic. Okay? And so the idea, broadly speaking, is what the text clearly seems to be able to say, which is if we have faith in Christ, we, we can do astonishing things. But we have to allow our faith to grow. And what's Jesus doing in these chapters? He's training the disciples. He's teaching them so their faith grows. And they're going to go through the horrific trial of the cross. 
Not in the same way that Jesus does, obviously, but it's still a trial for them. It's going to expose their lack of faith, and Jesus is going to use that to grow their faith. Whatever God's got for us, whether it's cancer or dog attacks or fevers or you know financial ruin or whatever else it is, please look at your trials as opportunities for growth. Opportunities for your little faith to be exposed. And the resolution is always the same. Trust Christ more. Do what he says. Turn to him. Kneel before him. Cry out to him. When Peter speaks of this, he says, humble yourself. And he says, and in the NIV it says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so the NIV gives us two commands, humble yourself before God and cast your cares. But in the Greek there's only one command, humble yourself before God by casting your cares upon him. When we come before Christ like this man and we kneel before him and we say, God, help me, we have humbled ourselves. That is humility. I can't do this. I need you. I think as Christians, we're tempted to do that in prayer and say, God, I can't do it. I need you and pray and then go off and try and do it anyway as if we never prayed that prayer. But that isn't to say that we shouldn't do anything. We've still got to do our due diligence. But I think that sometimes there's a line where we say, oh, well, I trust you, God. Please fix this. And, and, and until you do, I'm going to go and fix it myself. And so we just need to be people who are, who are just trusting Christ. And that faith of ours needs to grow. And that's what he's exposing. But there's one more thing here that is often missed. Look at the text closely. Matthew does not say... If you have the faith of a mustard seed, a mustard seed, um, indefinite, you will say to a mountain, he doesn't say that, does he? He says to what? This mountain. He could have said, he did say, look, if you, if you have the faith of, of a mustard seed, is very indefinite. Any mustard seed, no mustard seed in particular. I mean, there's millions of mustard seeds out there. Just pick anyone, any one, any mustard seed. It's small. If you could have faith that big, right? It doesn't matter which mustard seed. What he could have done is said, you could move a mountain. And the point then would have been, well, any mountain's big, right? And you can move something big. Right? But he doesn't say that. He could have said you can move the mountain, which is more definite. But he picks something that is even more specific and even more definite. And he says, this mountain. And that's why the context is so important, because this whole section has gone sequence after sequence without any change. He's got three on the mountain, come down the mountain, before the mountain transfiguration, here we are, Caesarea Philippi. Where's Caesarea Philippi? Under the shadow of Mount Hermon. Now where are we going? Up the mountain. We're up Mount Hermon. Now we're coming down Mount Hermon. Now there's more disciples. Now there's the crowd. And in that context, with that passage coming to an end, and you've got your markers. Look, last two verses. Son of man's going to be delivered. They're going to kill him and raise on the third day, which is a repetition of what was said in chapter 16 that caused Peter's rebuke. This whole section is kind of sandwiched in these references to Jesus. He's teaching them he's going to have to suffer and die. And everything is in that context. I will build my church, the gates of Hades will not overcome. These things are all within this context, right? So where is this mountain? This mountain is Mount Hermon. That's where we are geographically. Mount Hermon represents the satanic realm, demons and all of that. So I think what he's saying is he's taking an idiom, just which means, you know, broadly speaking, with a little faith you can do great things. But he's saying more than that. He's saying... This particular mountain that is the biggest in the region, that is particularly big, that is associated with the coming of the sons of God and the creation of the Nephilim and what led the world to be flooded and all that is demonic and evil and wicked, which is represented in this one boy here, but is far, far bigger and greater. All of that can be moved by faith. That's an important distinction. Because if you come away from this passage, like so many charismatics do, and say, oh, this passage is great. I want to go out and find someone who's sick that I can heal them. 
and go lay hands on someone for healing. You've missed the passage. The point here is this, that Satan is working his way and causing harm and damage, killing children and doing all sorts of harm, and no harm more great than the blindness of Israel rejecting their Messiah. And Jesus says, you few who are faithful in the midst of this perverse and unbelieving generation, you can have victory over the powers of darkness. You can overcome them. The point is not just the authority to cast out a demon. The point is Jesus having victory. And that's why one of the central statements in this whole broader section is the gates of Hades will not overcome the church that Jesus is building. And that isn't saying that Satan won't, because Satan and Hades is not the same thing. What it's saying is death won't. That all the work of the enemy to kill and to harm is going to accumulate in Jesus being killed on the cross. There is this astonishing mystery in Scripture whereby Satan wanted to kill Jesus. He literally possessed Judas so that Judas would betray Jesus, so that Jesus would be handed over and killed. He literally wanted Jesus to die. And yet in killing him, he defeated himself. Paul talks about this mystery in 1 Corinthians and elsewhere. Just, it's, it's an astonishing thing. Absolutely astonishing. And what Jesus is trying to teach the disciples, whose faith was small and they didn't know Jesus well enough, he's trying to teach them, look guys, look. I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to suffer. But that death is not going to stop me from building my church. Satan is going to kill me, but that isn't going to stop me. From building my church. My discipleship, my building of this kingdom, this spiritual kingdom that we've been dealing with from chapter 13 on. None of these things will hinder it. And the thing that is going to give you your portion, your part, your contribution to that kingdom is growing in faith. So friends, what are we pursuing? Are we pursuing comfort? Are we pursuing financial security? Are we pursuing health? Are we pursuing... Now, none of these things are wrong in of themselves, but our, our goal, our passion, our lives have to revolve around how do I come to know Jesus better and become more like him so I can take the works of the enemy and move them and cast them and conquer them. And so... The section ends, while they're gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them again, just wrapping up this section, a clear demarcation. I think if it was me, I'd have ended chapter 17 there, because I think this is the end of the section. And he says, son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, they'll kill him, he'll be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. He just keeps teaching them. Again and again, this is what you've got to learn. This is what you've got to learn. And they struggled. And some of you here, I'm certainly one of them, we're stubborn. And we keep having to learn the same lessons again and again and again. Jesus keeps showing us things and we keep rejecting it. Keep falling back into the same patterns, struggling with the same sins, focusing on the wrong things. And they're being told, this is going to have to happen, this is going to shake your faith, are you ready? I remember in my life, I've told you guys this before, going through terrible trials, trials I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, and just being so wholly unprepared for what was to come and it just exposing my little faith and as much as Peter's denials exposed his little faith. And I just want you guys with a passion, I want you to mature in faith so that when cancer comes, when trials come, when difficulties come, that you are strong. 
that you move mountains. That Satan comes a calling and you kick his butt. I think that's the spiritual term. Right? That, you, that he comes and he wants you to, he wants you to be stuttering and denying and, and, and unsure and where is God in the midst of this and, and what do I do? And, and, and you are going to rise up and you're going to say, I trust him. He is good and he is gracious and he is sovereign and he's given me salvation through the blood of his son and because of that I can trust him in all things and no I don't understand this and no I don't want this but I will trust him. And in the midst of our trials and our struggles we can proclaim Christ and do astonishing things and the work of the Satan can be vanquished. That's the kind of faith we're in. That's the business we're in. That's what we're about. Because Christ suffered and died and rose again so that we might suffer for his name's sake, empowered by the Holy Spirit that he gave to us so that we might live in his power for his glory. Let us grow in faith, friends, together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this passage of scripture. Father, you are constantly merciful to us. May we be grateful to you always. Glorify yourself in our lives and in this church, we pray. Amen.